really what sales is, is somebody has a problem or an opportunity they want to have. They want to get rid of the problem. They want to have an opportunity. How do we help facilitate them getting rid of that problem or gaining that opportunity? And then we get paid for it. That's selling. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Today, I am so delighted to have Doug C. Brown with me. How are you, Doug? I'm doing awesome, Wesley. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Let me tell you guys a bit about Doug. He is the CEO of CEO Sales Strategies and a sales revenue and profit growth expert. He is the creator of the Top 1% Academy, where he trains on how to sell to buyers, whether they be CEOs, business owners, or entrepreneurs, and how to be in the top 1% of sales earners doing so. So, Doug, tell us, how did you start your career and how did you get to where you are today? Well, I started working at the age of three for my dad's business. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, was, I was sweeping floors for 25 cents a week and... Um, I loved it because it, you know, back then you could buy a whole handful of candy for a penny, right? So, <laughs> so I was, I was sugaring myself to, you know, to, to the end at the end of the week and, you know, I could, all my friends and I would just have fun, right? So I started working there about the age of five or six. My dad actually pushed us out in front of clients and we had us writing orders and, and actually selling mm. when we were five or six years old. Uh, and I always joke cause I, my dad died young and I never realized whether or not he did that because, you know, he had low cost labor or he, you know, was trying to really teach us something, but that took root. And then what happened from there is I just started like thinking about business ideas. Cause I realized like when I was writing orders, I'd say, oh, we paid, you know, $3 for this part, but we sold it for six. And I'm only getting paid at that point, like a dollar an hour, right? So I'm like thinking, my gosh, you know, if I just sold 10 parts a day, I'd make $30, you know, $30 in doing this. But if I worked 10 hours a day, I was making $10. So the, the, the concept of leverage started sinking in early. And so I started side businesses when I was, was younger. I would go around and take people's paper routes, for example. And I'd spend, you know, I'd add a, a, a little snow blowing business in, in the winter time, you know, <laughs> but, you know, we, we had the blizzard of 78 back then. And my friend and I made about $600 in one day snow blowing. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's awesome. You know what I mean? Because nobody could get the snow out of there. So we had ultimate value. So we would, yeah. you know, we worked all morning, all night up, up to the night. But the reality is that's how it kind of all started. And. You know, I got my first bank loan at 13 because my brother co-signed and I started a business there. And I just learned that selling gave me the ultimate leverage and that if I was selling, I never was going to worry about having money because I always had money because I knew if I didn't, if I needed more money, I'd just go find something new to sell, mm. you know, that type of thing. Wow. So I really love that because one of the things that I have instilled in my children um, my son now, I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's going to work. I don't, yeah, that's not going to happen. He's like, but we can ask them, right, mom? I'm like, yes, we can ask them. He's like, they'll just say no. <laughs> and so it's starting at that young age and instilling those things that we don't even realize are sales skills or their life skills, right? So the fact that your dad at a very early age taught you the value of money, right? Like, so this is how you, what you do. And yeah, so we're going to get this much money, but you're only going to get this much money. And why? Because we have other people to pay. And then even at right. the age of 30, 13, really being able to seek financing and go out on your own. So after you were a teenager, what was the next step? What was your first real big boy job? <laughs> well, my I didn't know it at the time because I, I was never brought up in an environment where sales, it was just part of doing life. It was like part of breathing, right? You just sell. Mm -hmm. um, my first formalized sales role wasn't until my mid-20s. And, uh, well, actually my, yeah, kind of around 24 and I didn't really realize that they gave me a title of account executive and I didn't even know what that was. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was selling music equipment and I was going to college 
and I, I, I wanted to make money and I took a job at the mall and I'm like, I'm making like three, four dollars an hour. And I'm like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense to me. So I sought out a job that maybe I can make more leverage selling music equipment, best job ever in the world. Um, I, so I ended up selling music equipment to a lot of the bands that we used to listen to on the radios and still there today, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I sold music equipment to people like Aerosmith and the, the Eagles and Billy Joel's band and Paul McCartney's band and things like that. And it was great because I got to, you know, meet another side of life on top of, uh, you know, making money. So that was my first formalized job. From there, I went and finished college. And I got a couple of degrees, one in uh, business and biology, and then the other one in nuclear medicine. And I was like on my way to be a doctor because I figured that would be kind of like the, the societal thing to do, right? But when I went to go get a nuclear medicine job, what I realized was, was I was making more selling music equipment <laughs> than they were offering me with, you know, six years, eight years of degrees of college. So in my brain, it went, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. So I think what I'll do is I'll try this sales thing for a living. Then I went out and got a first formalized sales position and I tripled my nuclear medicine income in my first year. Wow. You know, the thing, the I, I like to tell young people coming up these days, I actually went to my, my same son, the eight-year-old, um, to his third grade class on career day. And of course, I was the only person who was an entrepreneur and a salesperson and a, chem a former chemist. And I like to tell them, like, college teaches you how to think, okay? Doesn't really matter. Major in something that you enjoy, that you're passionate about, so you can get through and you can get your degree. But when you get out into the world there's a very high likelihood that you're not going to be using that degree for what you right. went to school for. And I know my chemistry degree taught me how to think. I did use it for about five years, but I've not used my degree for a lot more than I have used it, right? <laughs> and it's because like, I understand process. I understand this. I understand that. I got experience public speaking because I had to present papers. And you, you use right. your degree for the same thing. It was like, okay, I have these two degrees and yeah, I can use this here, but what else can I do with it? And I, I bet right. you've never touched nuclear medicine in your professional career. No, well, not, not really. I mean, I worked, I worked emergency call part-time just to try to keep my license because back, you know, I had so much invested in it. I was like, well, I should keep my license. But then what happened was my income started precipitously going up while I was selling. And then I had another side business that took off. So I was literally making hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. you know, in doing that. And, and the, my brain was just like, well, it doesn't make sense to, you know, go back. So that's what happened. And I, I'm so surprised, like when you go to restaurants, you don't like look and you go, how many, you know, uh, moles of energy are in this whatever <laughs> <laughs> chemistry. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. You know, and the thing, like literally, like you said, it's, what is the passion? So as you're thinking about, you know, whether you're in this place of your life where what is my next step going to be? What is the first step that is going to be? Should I start my own business? Should I do this? Should I do that? A lot of times I say, just try it. And if it doesn't work, then you have a degree, you have experience, go back and find a job. You can do it, right? Like just literally rip the bandaid off and just go try. Well, I mean, but you have that power of being able to, to create something, right? Because you know how to sell and how to produce. Yeah. And, and I've often had um, arguments with, with higher education that sales is not a soft skill. Sales is a life skill. And now they've been embracing it more and more now that the, you know, the shift has happened, so to speak. There are many more universities and colleges actually starting to put programs like that in there. But you know, for me, I, I didn't have any formalized sales training except for my father. And, you know, your, 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 your eight year olds getting the same type of training through osmosis. And what we don't realize is, and Dan Pink wrote a great book called The Sell is Human. And it's basically saying, look, every human being on the planet sells in some capacity, whether we're selling to get it into a job or into a relationship or you know, we want to, I don't know, get to the head of the line at the, you know, the club or whatever. And we're trying to convince the bouncer to let us in or something. We, we are selling in some capacity. It's just unfortunate that the years of the past and some people even in present 
they have a way that if you ask the people, you know, what's your one word if you if you thought of sales, they'd be like pushy, you know, manipulative, whatever, right? Those are really bad salespeople, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So the the good salespeople are really it's more like uh, I remember the Wizard of Oz, the good witch, bad witch thing, right? You know, the wicked witch of the north or whatever. Those are bad salespeople, but you know, the good witch is a really good salesperson. And really what sales is, is somebody has a problem or an opportunity they want to have. Mm -hmm. They want to get rid of the problem. They want to have an opportunity. How do we help facilitate them getting rid of that problem or gaining that opportunity? And then we get paid for it. Mm -hmm. That's selling. That's literally it. And so, as you said, sales skills are life skills. And I've even had the opportunity to develop some programs for high schoolers where mm. we're, they're, we're, they're talking about sales skills as life skills that early because a lot of times you don't know how to sell yourself. Like you don't, you can't sell yourself. Selling yourself is a first thing that you learn to sell. And so when people are having trouble getting a job or they can't get a new position or they can't get a promotion, it's because those core sales skills that they don't have. And when people block themselves off and they say, oh, I hate sales. Um, so I, I don't want to talk to salespeople. Do you say I hate doctors because you had one bad doctor? I hate dentists. Right. I'm never going to get my teeth clean again. Absolutely not. So why do you have to put the one bad or the two bad or even the five bad salespeople that tapped into you all in the same box? Right. Well, I, because I think it's more prevalent than just you go to the dentist, for example, and you know you're not going to like it most of the time, right? I mean, it's just it's, it's not good. It's not. Yeah. Right? yeah. Sorry, dentist, but you know I I, I have to go to the dentist uh, Wednesday, right, and get two teeth taken care of. And I'm like, Oh, no, I know it's coming, right? So, so I think, you know, but a dentist, you go every once in a while, mm -hmm. too. And usually when the problems solved, the problem solved, salespeople, we interact with every single day. Yeah. And so I think part of that is, most people are, they don't know, they don't know how to play win win mm -hmm. in life. So they don't play win win in selling, and then they make selling into a competition. Mm -hmm versus a competitive sport that both people win. Mm, that's and I think that's where they get into trouble because, you know, and to them, you know, they, they've got quotas and they've got to hit numbers and, you know, but the reality is most people selling, the reason they play those games and do those things, A, their ego's involved or B, they just don't have enough leads. And so what they do is they run into a scarcity mindset. And when they're in that place, then they go into the manipulation, anything to try to make the money. So tell us about, I want to dig into that. You said the win-win. How do you, first of all, what do you mean by win-win? And secondly, how do you achieve that win-win balance? So win-win means they win, we win. And you achieve that balance by being the first to disengage if we recognize that it's not win for both parties. Mm. That's really hard for people. Um, in some regards, until they understand if they are in a position where they have so many people to talk to that it doesn't matter, right? So I teach people a, a lot when we're, we're working on the, you know, gaining, getting from point A to point B or point B to point C. The master prospector will always outclose the master closer, if you will, mm -hmm. always. And the reason behind that is because the master prospector has much uh, a, a larger percentage of choice and they've always got incoming business. So they're not holding on too tightly. The master closer relies on their closing skills. So if they only got five people to talk to in a, in a month, let's say, and but they're really good at closing, they're going to go into that skill set of closing with a master prospector goes, you know what, this isn't the right Fit. I don't need this. I'm. I'm gonna. I play win-win. Now that's how I always have, have sold, and I disengage. And so I teach people: you be the first to disengage because you'd be really surprised when you disengage and you tell them why you're disengaging. Many times you expand your circle of influence at that point because they go, "Wow, <laughs> you're so truthful. I really appreciate you not taking me down the wrong path." By the way, I got three friends that I'd like to introduce you to. 
So there you expand the circle. Therefore, you're winning because they're they're reciprocating. They're winning because you didn't put them in a place. You know, I mean, you can disengage in different ways too. You can disengage and say, this isn't right. I'm not going to touch it. Mm -hmm. um, or you can disengage and say, listen, this isn't right, but I know who it's who can serve you. Yeah. So I'd like to bring that person to your attention mm. and let them deal with you because they're going to do a better job. And that's what selling is about is to help them accomplish a goal. Mm. Taking the customer on a journey and the customer has to allow you to be their guide on that journey. And you mentioned a concept that a prospector is better than a closer. A strong prospector is better than a closer. Um, and <clears throat> it made me think about how our sales funnel actually is built. It's wider at the top and smaller at the bottom, right? And why is it so wide at the top? Because everything that comes into the funnel isn't going to come out. And so if you only focus your efforts on converting and closing, then your likelihood of success is a lot lower than if you focus on filling the top of the funnel with the right people and getting them through the process and qualifying them, and then you'll get more out at the bottom. You will, as long as you build relationships too. You know, people always talk about the ABCs always be closing. You know, I, I'm always talking about always building a relationship. So it's, you know, ABR. ABR, right? ABR, <laughs> yeah, 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 the ABR, yeah. And, and because relationships in anything, I mean, we do, we go the, to extended lengths to help someone we care about, whether that be a friend, a significant other who's a friend, right? Or, or whatever. And we just, we just do, we call our friends, we just check in on them and we say, Hey, haven't talked to you in you know three months. How, how's life? Right. But how many people, when they sell somebody, they don't check in with that person ever mm. right they <laughs> um and so it's always about building a relationship and that is part of playing win-win too because when we're building a relationship we're actually telling this person you matter and when they know that they matter they're more likely to want to be in your circle mm. and they're more likely to help one another in that circle. That's what networking groups are all about. It isn't about you show up once a week and exchange leads. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what net some networking groups do. But networking is really about having relationships that you can pick up the phone and call and say, I have a challenge or I have a, an opportunity. You know, um, I, I'm doing something right now with, with my, my group of networking and I'm thinking of expanding something in my business and I'm going to drop, you know, several hundred thousand dollars into the expansion. And I'm like, maybe I should check with my group and let them give me feedback to make sure I don't make a mistake. Right. Yeah. So that's what we're, we're in the process of doing, but it's because they trust me and I trust them because we built relationships over a long period of time that they'll give me that truthful feedback. And we all need that in life. So tell us more about how you really build those true camaraderies within a networking circle. Because whether we're a CEO or individual contributor within an organization, it's good to have allies that are sometimes within the organization, but especially outside, so that we can get different perspectives. So how do you go about really developing that true relationship? Well, you do it through developing any relationship, right? So you find things that they like, or things that will help them and you're proactive about it. Mm -hmm. So like I complimented you on your earrings because I truly think they're fantastic, right? So, and whoever gave them to, you know, you could say a guy that I didn't even know, you know, you know, came on my podcast and he was talking about the earrings. Thank you for giving him, right? That type of thing. But since I know, you know, you have a child who's eight years old and you're a great mom and you're teaching your child on how to get life skills. And I know that you love earrings. Let's just say for some reason, uh, you know, I run across these really cool earrings in this really cool place. That's just like, I'm like, Ooh, that's great. Now I just send a message over to you and say, Hey, what's, I, I haven't talked to you in a little bit. I, I found this resource for amazing earrings and it made me think of you. Right. You know, hope you're having a good day, right? Check this out if it's, if it's any value, right? Just, so it's just a little bit of contact or, you know, I found this thing going on with kids who are going to be turning 10 where it's teaching them life skills 
and I thought of your child. Mm. And so it's about creating a human connection as well as a business connection because the, most people focus on the business connection. Mm. In reality, human beings have two types of ROI we look for. Mm. Our business ROI, yeah. i.e. if I find something that's great now for your business, I can bring that to you. Mm. But we also have a personal ROI yeah. and, and people forget about that personal ROI. That's how you build these strong, intimate relationships. You know, um, I mean, I've got one buddy of mine, Michael, that we met through a business relationship. We've been in contact for 25 years, almost, oh gosh, it's going on 25 years. Wow. Michael and I may not talk more than once or twice a year, mm. but every time we do, it's like we're back yeah, like brothers, right? Yeah. So it's, and, and, you know, and frankly, he just threw me two clients out of the blue. He hadn't even talked to me, but he's like, somebody needs help in improving their sales and getting from point A to point B in their business. He told them about me. They contacted me and both of them closed like instantaneously. Mm. So I call Mike and I'm like, hey, you know, how's Laura? Because that's his wife. Mm -hmm. And he said, she's doing great. I said, how's, you know, the nursing, you know, she's a nurse, you know, and so how's the, the political scene going on in the hospitals? And we talked a little bit about that. And I said to him, I said, hey, I just want to verify your mailing address. And here's what he said to me. No way. Yeah. And I said, well, I said, why not? He goes, you're not sending me money. Hmm. I said, well, then tell you what, what's your, what's your, you and your wife's favorite restaurant now? I knew what it was before. And my wife and I are going to come out and we're going to buy you dinner mm. because we haven't seen each other in almost a year. So let's get together. And this gives us the reason. Wow. Wow. Right? So that, now here's the weird part. People think CEOs of major companies don't want to do that. Right? Like I can't call the CEO out of the blue because they're CEO or the senator or whoever, you know, let's name the title, right? And it's not the case. The case is that these people in high level positions are as appreciative as people who are not, right? So I have a CEO, he's turning 90 this year. He's still at his company. He's still working. <laughs> right? They're doing, you know, at last run, they were doing 350 million a year. I have been calling pretty much without fail every year on his birthday and just saying, Hey, how you doing? Right. And then, so one year I was driving by and, and I said to my kids, I said, let's go get a cake, stop by and have some cake with him. His birthday's in a couple of days. And so we did. And the man literally cried mm. because we cared enough about him. Here, here's the bottom line. I can call his company and anybody in his company will do anything that, you know, within reason that I ask because we build a relationship. Yeah. What did he do with the cake, by the way? He shared it with all the employees. Yeah. And so I want to unpack the the things that you just said, because that was some fantastic insight. And those were some great stories and, and nuggets. And so you are speaking specifically about relationship, but I want to help all the listeners understand that this is not just hey, let's go golf. Oh yeah, I like to golf all the time, so I just wanna take you to golf. What Doug is doing is he is listening, actively listening to the things that make people tick and he is giving them valuable insights. He is giving them things that are important to them. So when you build a relationship, whether it's in life, it's in sales, it's in business, you must ensure you are stepping into the customer's world. You are stepping into that person's world and you are doing the things that, that, that are of value to them. And I can make this go a little bit deeper. And I, sometimes on the podcast, I talk about love languages. And um, <laughs> so my love language is gifts, right? And when I, but I like thoughtful gifts. I would rather, like I had one of my best friends for Christmas sent me a book that she had just read. Like it was her daily devotional for the past year. And she was like, I'm sending a piece of part of my heart to you. Literally something that she had done. 
versus somebody going and saying, oh, I'm going to buy you some Gucci slippers for $300. And I'm like, yeah, that does nothing for me. Right. And so really thinking about how that person ticks and what they communicate, how they take things up like that person who you bought that birthday cake for. Probably he's probably never had anybody do that for him just out of the blue. Somebody getting a handwritten note. Many people don't do that or recognizing that, you know, their, their child is about to have a birthday or their child is going through a sickness, like really stepping into that customer's world. And then as you're out there and you're prospecting again, going back to our prospecting bit, you use those, that's a valuable touch. A valuable touch is not following up on my last email, following up on my last email. It's doing a little bit of digging and going and checking out what's happening in their world and giving them something that is important to them. Right. And, you know, and, and, and being able to communicate on that level, because we all want to know that someone cares about us. So the more that we know about that person, the more that we can lean into it. Like I knew you had a, a degree in chemistry because we had spoken before about it. And so I knew to throw the mole thing in there because people may not be listening. They may not even know what that is, but it, it is a, it's things. I remember going through general chemistry and remember f- having to figure out all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't like this math, but you went through all, <laughs> all of this, right? So my, the point that you make is so important. It's, it's that it doesn't have to be a big thing. It, in your case, it's a thoughtful gift. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I can show your audience. I wrote down right here on the paper, thoughtful gift. Right? Right <laughs> thoughtful gift. Right? Yes. Right. So now I learned this from Harvey McKay. He wrote a book called Swim with the Sharks. Okay. okay? And Harvey, I was fortunate enough to win a sales. I, I, I won this big sales award and they invited me to this thing where they were giving away like a Mercedes and I was like, whatever. It was at the Biltmore Hotel in Arizona. And the company that I sold this for as an independent, I was an independent sales rep. They flew me down there, put me up at the Biltmore. And what I didn't know were the two speakers for 150 people in this room. Speaker number one was Mr. Tony Robbins. And speaker number two was Harvey McKay. And Tony was a big influence in my life. And, you know, uh, and I actually did get a chance to meet him, a whole different story there. And I ended up becoming his president of training and sales for his company for seven years for his business stuff. Um, but Harvey McKay was such a gentleman. When he got done, I walked over and I said, I really enjoyed this part of your conversation, you know, your talk. And I said, I have a few questions. Do you mind if I ask you? And he said, why don't you grab my bags and walk me to my limo and you can ask me anything you want? Wow. Now I'm a young guy. He's an older guy. I'm like, heck, I'll carry your bags. I'll carry you if you <laughs> answer my question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we did. And what he told me about was what he called the McKay 66. And the McKay 66 is 66 individual fields that he always looked at and he understood his buyers. And he told me a story about one of his companies that they got. Um, the son was ill. And the son was in the hospital of the CEO of this company they wanted to go after. And he re- he realized that they were hockey fans and that the son was a very big hockey fan. And this was a $10 million sale. Mm. So Harvey went and got the professional hockey team in that area mm. to actually go to the hospital to see his son. And they, so you had these NHL players taking pictures with his son. Mm. He had a $10 million annual recurring contract with his company because he sent hockey players because he listened. And he said, I have these fields. And he gave me these fields. So I, I kind of like embraced that concept um, with, with Harvey. And so I'm very grateful to him. But the reality is what I've learned is people and love languages are very important that people don't think, you know, my wife says she needs to hear it verbally. Words of affirmation. So That's I, my number two. Right. <laughs> Uh, and gifts are also on her lips, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I make a conscious effort to, usually daily, sometimes I mess it up, but I have conscious effort to to tell her how much I appreciate her. And then I also, once a month, regardless, I go out and buy her some type of gift, earrings, jewelry, something. And, you know, I, I don't go lavish over the top, but I, I give it to her and I said, I was thinking of you and this is what I 
have, right? We got the great relationship. So guys, if you're not listening to this, get your head out of your, your, right. your socks and listen to this because it, you know, um, but this is selling. Yeah. And that's what people don't think. Yeah. It's not bribery. Right. It's selling. It's listening to people's needs, wants, needs, fears, and desires yeah. and being able to help them bridge that gap. Absolutely. And I, I, I call what you, you're you talking about, I call it filling your love tank. And so in a professional sense, we have quote unquote love tanks that need to be filled. And so right. if you understand, like if I know that my buyer, my prospect communicates through written words, I am not going to send them a video. I like to do video. It is so easy for me to record a video. Two seconds, I'm done. Right. right? But they don't want that. I literally sent my best friend this podcast I listened to this morning. I was like, this is so good. It's 75, it was 75 minutes long. She clicked on, she said, I'm not going to listen to that. Give me the cliff notes. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> and the thing is like in life, you do what people need. Like, it's not about you. You have to diminish what you care about, how you want to do it. And if you want to connect with a buyer and especially higher level buyers, right? So the higher up on the food chain, you're, prospect is your buyer is the more you need to step into their world and do the things that they need like forget about what you want and think about them right without compromising our own integrity or our own you know values right i i, I firmly agree in in the higher up that they are remember they pay more right usually so it's it's it makes more sense for us to actually take that extra time and and, and this is the thing in selling how many sales a year do we actually need to be in the top 1%? Mm. And people never figure that number out. Yeah. It? And they just don't. And it's, and it's like blows my mind. And it's like, I can show people, you know, look, if you had 10 sales a year, you can make yourself into that place in your industry. In most cases, you don't have to change a lot of what you're doing. It's just a matter of going after the right ideal client profile versus just selling to anybody because mm. that's what a lot of people do but you'll find the people who are in the top five percent and up they're very targeted about who they interact with because they know like every human being we have 24 hours a day yeah right yeah. in order to do that so we ha we must like make our model work for us mm -hmm. and a lot of people have an incorrect model to get to their goal and that's another part of what catches them Absolutely. I 100% agree. You have had a very long and diverse career starting at the age of three. Can you share a, an experience in your life, either personally or professionally, that has impacted the way that you show up and lead today? Oh, wow. There's so many of them. Um, I, I, will, I will tell you, and you know this from having a child, I'm sure. I shouldn't assume. The birth of my children was something that gave me the ultimate humility in life. Because up until that moment, I didn't realize that I wasn't in control. <laughs> <laughs> now that is the truth. <laughs> right? On, on all levels, right? Just the actual birth, it is, it's like, it's so cool to see another human being come out with a personality and then, you know, the second one comes along and they have a distinctly different personality, but there's a connection to the earth and universe that I never realized that there's, you know, we always talk about, well, there's much bigger things than us. That, that was like profound for me. It was like, okay, there's a big world out here. I'm a part of it. What part am I going to play? Right. And so <clears throat> then having children, you realize you're not in control either. Mm -hmm. You know, people think they are, but they, they grow up and, and you're still not in control as they grow up. And so how do we look at our children and sell to them in a way that they accept? Right? Because, you know, I have Gen Zers and <laughs> they think very differently, you know, than, than, than my generation for sure. And they're always schooling me on on their generation, which I'm always trying to learn because these are people who are going to be uh, and are already making decisions in life. So I've got to be able to relate to them. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's difficult for me being, you know, 61 years old, having a 22 year old and trying to relate. We were just having a discussion on music the other day. And I'm like, I just don't understand. 
understand. I like educate me, right? So I think having children is is really created humility, but it's also created a sense that we constantly are in a learning phase and it never ends mm. if we want to continue to grow. That's good. Yeah. And now I'm not suggesting everybody go out and have kids to figure this out. I'm <laughs> suggesting that that we must be in a constant and never ending growth mode because everything in life shifts. Sales has shifted. I was telling people back when dial up came in, this is going to shift the information, you know, flow. People told me I was crazy. <laughs> this was back in like the, you know, the, the, um, the late eighties mm -hmm. that, you know, when, when dial up was there, I'm like, well, think about it. You can get a, a, a document on something. Yeah. It takes you eight minutes to download it, but I mean, <laughs> you can still get it. Yeah. Right. And, and now they'll have information that we don't have. Yeah. And, and so that, that would be, you know, I think the most profound thing, whether it was business or whatever that's, that's happened, that kind of shaped part of my thought process. And when we have children, our value systems shift as well. Absolutely. I 100% agree. I actually, I have a, my uh, eight year old, he's, he's nine now. Um, he's gen alpha. So this is a whole new generation. And my son, he's gen Z and he's like, yeah, you guys don't even know what it's like to have cell phone with buttons. And I'm like, you don't know what a world is without cell phones. Come on now. <laughs> right? Like <laughs> what, what are you even talking about? And so it, the way that they really help us shape the way the, how we show up, right? Because there are so many right. lessons from our children that we translate into business. Right. And I always like to say, yeah, your sales team are not kids, but let me use some lessons from parenting here. Right. And so, so the way that they challenge us and the way that they show up and encourage us and remind us of the amazing people that we are, right? So all of those right. things. And um, I'm so glad that your children have been able to inspire you and impact the way that you show up each and every day. Well, and the way your children are impacting you. I mean, they're teaching you about blue ocean strategy because they're, they're thinking a different way. And so we can now take our life's experience, their life's experience and understand a new place to go. And that's what blue ocean strategies are all about in business. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's finding an ocean that's not, you know, crowded with, uh, with everybody else where you can kind of get in and dominate that. And, you know, children in their perspective, you know, does that, mm -hmm. um, in a, in a big way. So, um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, really kind of cool to hear, hear, hear you say that about your children. So I know. That's awesome. <laughs> so Doug, this has been a fantastic conversation. What is the one best way that people can get in contact with you if they want to chat with you and learn more? Well, if they want to reach me directly, they could send me an email to Doug at CEO sales strategies.com. My LinkedIn is Doug Brown, one, two, three. Uh, if they want to send a general information, you know, email in, uh, just send it into you matter, Y O U M A T T E R at CEO sales strategies.com. And of course you can always check out the website and just type in Doug C Brown, you know, sales revenue growth expert. I'll, I'll come up on multiple pages. So. Awesome. 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 Well, Doug, as I said, this conversation has enriched me and no, I know it has enriched our listeners. So thank you so much for your time, your talent and your expertise today. Well, thank you for having me here. And that was another episode of the Transformed Sales Podcast. In all that you do every day, try to get 1% better. Until next time.